Today we have the opportunity to welcome to the Elman Studios Rabbi Eliyahu Klein, who's a seasoned mechanic as well as the head counselor at Matzif Midwest. We're going to be discussing what parents should know before sending their child to sleepaway camp. Welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you, Mary, for having me. Wow. So first of all, you introduced me as Rabbi Eliyahu Klein. Actually, in the camping world, I'm known as Rabbi Eli Klein. So for those that got confused for a moment, <laughs> that's me. I believe camping changed since I remember sleeping camp growing up. Things are probably a bit different. Um, what are, what's the youngest age that you have in Camp Matzev? It's a good question. So by us, we start with four, coming out of fourth grade, believe it or not. It's a very, very young age. Um, and it's difficult for a parent, obviously, to have kids, even at a fourth grade, to stay home. Sometimes parents need to go away. Um, the camp that we have, most of the boys are coming from a community or a school, yeshiva, that gives us gives off for both halves of the summer. So to have your son going to sleep to day camp in the city, but staying home, it's a little difficult. So people want to send away already from fourth grade. Is that an ideal age to send the child away? It is for the right type of boy. The, boy, the right type of boy needs to be a little bit independent on his own. He needs to be able to run his own program. You know, there are some boys called mommy boys. Um, sometimes those type of boys even are mommy's boys until they're uh, 15, 16, right. or even when they get married. Um, so you definitely cannot be a mommy's boy. Um, I'm not saying that we never had such a type of boy. Very often we get kids that it's their first time being away from camp. Be away from home, and uh, they have what they call they, they have a what homesick. Is, homesick. Exa- oh, homesick, exactly, exactly that type of sickness. Homesick. But Baruch Hashem, we have a very successful way how to get a kid rid of his homesickness. Actually, we don't just have a camp mother. We have in our camp we have a camp zadi. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, this older individual with a white beard, and he has that zadi touch. And uh, it works beautifully. A child, fourth grade, coming to camp. Um, I don't know, younger kids could get, get dirty and messy and catch frogs and sit in the mud. Who's there to make sure, like a, like a real mother, to make sure that they have counselors, the Bachram from Yeshiva. But what are the chances that they took a shower that morning? And what are the chances that these fourth graders are going to have proper hygiene and take care of themselves? Great question. So, first of all, just to explain, when we, do the, the, when we do the staff training for the counselors, I teach the counselors that you are their father, their mother, their brother, their sister. You, to that camper, and it doesn't have to be going at a fourth grade. You'd be going at a ninth grade. You are everything to that kid. If a kid t- didn't take a shower that night, who else knows about it besides for you? If the kid's not eating properly, you know about it. If the kid is having a good time or he's not having a good time, if he's fighting, not fighting, it's all you have to be the eyes and ears of everything. And we choose counselors that, are, that could fit that role, that are very caring. There are those rah-rah, gishmaka counselors jumping on top of the tables. Those are generally not for the fourth graders. Not that they can't be, but they need that strong sense of real maturity looking after the responsibility of their kids. So besides for which, we also very much talk about taking showers in camp to the campers. We talk about hygiene. Um, we have for the whole bunk, it's a whole rotation, who gets the showers. Everybody knows you've got to take one, and everybody's on top of that game. But definitely, very often, the division heads, by, uh, the division head by us, younger, is designed to be for the younger bunks, a tatty type of division head that will specifically look after these areas as well. And he very quietly may go over to a boy and say, you know, Chaim, it doesn't look like you, you might be scared of water. I see you drinking sometimes, but don't be scared to get it on your head. You know, and make, uh, you know, make it a nice way, a cute little r- remark sometimes to get the kid to... Uh, that covers all bases, scary dreams, a night crying. I don't know, there's lots that goes on. Yeah, there, there may be a lot that goes on. Um, Baruch Hashem, usually a kid that goes to camp, he's coming into camp 
to have a great time, and he will have a great time. Yeah, you have those few kids, like I said, homesick, and there's sometimes this happens, sometimes that happens, but in general, a kid walks into camp, he forgets what happens at home. He forgets all his fears. He forgets what he's not good at, maybe what he's good at at home, maybe he's not such a good kid, maybe he's not on the best terms with his friends, or his parents are always down his back to do this, to do that. In camp, he has a new fresh start. And therefore, they walk into camp in this bubble, in this zone, and they go completely all in, which is really why camp is the best thing for kids. Because they really could have a fresh start and they could just be themselves. It's, it's unbelievable what a month in the summer could do to a kid. You've seen black and white big changes? I, I cannot tell you the amount of stories. Again, I've been camping for, for many, many years. Camp Matzev is around for so far three years. But the stories that I could tell over, I, I heard this uh, shame of Yaakov Kamenetsky already. He said, you know, what a month in camp could do. Oh, really? Yeah, ten, uh, ten months of, of school year cannot. But it's not just kids, by the way, that don't do well in school could also do well in camp. It's just not just like that. It's also kids that do well in school could do phenomenal in camp. But yeah, I could tell you boys that we were warned, you know, this kid doesn't get so well. So by the way, we, we, we look into that as well. Um, just to go off topic for one moment, very often, you know, how do I know my son's going to be safe? How is it not going to be exposed from other campers? You know, it's a very, very good question, which I'm sure you can ask. Yes. But, uh, so before we... You say it could, could change in a month. I would assume it could mean either way. Right. Which is, yeah. which is a very scary point to think about. Which is, so step A, let's talk about in general, you're a parent and you want to send your kid to camp. What should you look for that you shouldn't have these issues and that you, your son should have that amazing summer experience to come home a different child. Every summer is the best summer yet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I t we, we do in counselor training is I tell the counselors that your job is to give this kid his best summer of his life. And they heard that last year, and they heard it the year before. And the campers got that last year and the year before, and this year they're going to get it again. So when you're looking for that camp, to send your child. First thing, obviously, to look for is, is this camp hashkafically in line with our hashkafas? You want to send them to a place that you feel comfortable with. Who is at the top? Are they mechanchem? Are they mechanchem making the decisions? What type of staff do they have? What type of counselors do they have? Are they true role model b'nei taira? That's what I look for specifically in a counselor. Role model B'nai Taira. In fact, just to go off, again, the ADD a little bit, <laughs> which is very good in camp. You have to have a little ADHD. Um, we ha I had boys that were in eighth grade, and they were going to a Masifta after the summer, which wasn't the most high caliber. And in camp, their counselor, like, they didn't do much as, as to give over some major hashpa. They were mashpiyim, they're not rabbeim, they're counselors. But he caused such a roishim on this boy, the way he davened and learned and knew how to be a rock star. The kid in camp called up his mother and said, I want to go to that masifta. Could we do something that in two weeks, when yeshiva starts, I could go to a different yeshiva? So that's a success story. So anyways, getting back to no, the No, no, what's the end of the story? Yes, the kid, when he's yeah, yeshiva, definitely. Yeah. And by the way, I get lots of phone calls in camp with 8th grade with Masiftas. They call up. They said this kid now all of a sudden wants to go. What's his deal? How's he doing in camp? Do you think it could last? Because kids really, especially when they come in and they really see, hey, I could really have a good time. It's geschmack to be a yid. It's not just a song. It's a real thing. And that's what we try to do in camp. So what do you look for in a counselor? Because I know you have, you can have a Matsuyan who's a real Ben Taira and he steigs. You have someone who's great at creating, you know, creating color songs and being uh, good with Ruach and hype. So what, what is it that you're looking for when choosing counselors? So what, what I'm looking for is the ultimate hybrid of both. It's a little bit hard to find. 
It's not so common. It, you, sometimes the guy that's busy, you know, he knows how to make a call over song and a call over play. Very often in the middle of writing those songs in yeshiva during the year. But, <laughs> so what we look for is a real, a real, a true role model. That a, he, he doesn't just daven because, oh, he needs to daven. He davens because that's what he does as a yid. No one tells the counselors, go learn during Seder. The kids, they're in their own learning groups. The counselors have a, have a Seder. We have a Camp Rav, we give Shir, they have Chavrusas. No one on top of them tell them, go inside, because no one needs to be. They're going because they love learning. And when it's time to close up, they have, they give the kids a phenomenal time. So yeah, we try to look for the best of both. Because you also have these counselors, it's their being as them too. So I'm assuming that they're also looking to have a good time all within the camp setting. That is true. It's often, in my camping history, I've had to remind counselors, you're not a camper. You know, you're here to have a good time. <laughs> you're the counselor. Uh, but Baruch Hashem, the counselors that come to camp, this is their good time. They're not looking to go on a, go- on a road trip. They're not looking for, for, to have their own good time. They understand that to have a really good time is when you give a good time to somebody else. And that's in true in, in this entire world. And that, that trains them into a counselor that wants to become a Rebbe will have such previous experience like no other. It's, it's, it's good experience for, for Sean Bias. It's good experience for parenting. So a counselor that comes to camp and he says... I know that to have a good time, I'll give these campers a good time. He comes out. By the way, it's amazing how many applications, how many staff members want to come to camp. It's overloaded. And they all hear how an amazing type of experience they could have and how they could grow in camp and how they could become better people. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's a win-win. And that means the counselors come back to yeshiva also recharged and ready to roll another zman. I, I've had Rosh Hashivas call me up after the summer and they said, what goes on in camp? This guy was always a good guy, but he come, came back with such a firebrand. Mamash mas miratzum. Was he luring the whole time in camp? I said, no, that guy was actually jumping on the tables. He was the calm caller general. But they come back invigorated with like this passion, this ruach of really being a to be a yid. Yeah. So let's go back to the question, which you started, well, well I started, but, so what, what to look for in a camp? So we spoke about that ashkafically, correct? Now, as a disclaimer, stories do happen. All over. So what to know in the situation of my kid went to camp and something happened. So the idea, number one, the idea is like we just said, ashkafically, find out if this is what type of camp you want to send your kid to. What I mean is as follows. So very often you have kids that may, may go to the same yeshiva as you, but like, as you send your son, but you don't really want them to be your kid's friends. So it's very hard to really know exactly, but if it's all one type, that might not always be the best thing. Because in all one type, you have a little bit pushing left and pushing right. So what I tend to look for and try to create is a well-rounded program, a well-rounded type of boy. The main thing that to look for is obviously what's he being exposed to at home. And that's we go through the strong vetting process. Every kid is strongly vetted to make sure that he's coming from a scuffically good you know, background, what do they do at night, what does the family does, you know, the family dynamic, but after that, you got to dive in. you really got to dive in that nothing, you know, that, that nothing bad happens, at the end of the day, like I said, anything can happen, so you really have to trust the camp that they have the, your, their eyes and ears all over the place, and that's what I do by us, I train the counselors, and any staff member, you are the eyes and ears the entire time. I'll have guys walking around OD at night. They not necessarily are there to, you know, 
reprimand or say be quiet. They're there to pass by, to listen in if anything is going on. Because we're very, very mockered that a kid should come into the summer. He's got to have an aliyah. So the kids know it. The counselors know it. And that's what, as a parent, you should be looking for. Make sure that the camp that you're sending your kid, they are very mockbred on these things. Now, another thing to keep in mind is what is the activities in the camp that your kid is going to go to? So, generally, most of the day in most boys' camps... Sports. It's sports, exactly. Now, that's awesome. Because at the end of the day, the best way for a kid to take out his energy is on the sports field. But if it's only sports, and your kid is not super into sports, okay, he likes playing basketball, but what else is he doing? You got to be careful. What else is he doing? So, the pro- so okay. there are camps that are called sports camps. They're more usually more to the left, but they're sports camps, and that's the that's what a kid goes for. He's, he wants to be an athlete one day. So he goes to camp, and they play sports all day long. Then there's the, the typical camp that has sports most of the day. And then it comes night activity. And what do they play for night activity? Oh, a staff versus kids, a campers, basketball game, more sports. And then they go to sleep. So the kid that doesn't love sports so much, what's he doing? Then, when I was younger, they were like, Camps with like programs for kids that don't like sports. And what do they do? Remember this guy told me, today's activity, for four hours we ran around with a ketchup bottle, chasing the head counselor to pull ketchup on top of his head. We finally got him after he jumped into the pool. That's awesome. But you have to be, if your kid wants that, make sure you send them to that camp. Most kids need a balance. They need a place for sports. They need a place that the other, there's another activity that they could do that they could feel good about. Some kids, like you mentioned in the beginning, will sit around and catch frogs, you know, and be, be, be that type of guy, which is also fine. So that's fine. So I try to create a, a little well-rounded program where you have great sports, but you also have other activities. Like you could play music or record your own music in a music studio. You could, you could learn how to smoke meat or even learn how to play guitar or how to change a car, how to change a tire on a car. There's so many things that you, valuable things that you could do in a camp that, like I said, a kid wants to come in camp and leave camp feeling like, wow. I, I, I'm worth something. I could do something. I'm amazing at something. We'll also make sure to give a little, give time. If a kid wants, he could learn how to ba- uh, uh, bat better. He could learn how to shoot better. You want to give the kid, you want to make sure that the kid could do whatever he can to be the best. So fourth grade is a little young. We're saying that, that can work for some children. What age is a is an ideal age where it's good for everybody? It's not always good for everybody. What's the good age to send kids to sleep again? So yeah, so by, uh, even though I said we saw with fourth grade, but it is the smallest, definitely the smallest group. I would think that the best ideal age to send your kid start in sixth grade. So if you drop young, most parents wait to seventh grade. It's between the sixth and seventh grade. I think that the sixth grade, when you go to sixth grade, you have an advantage that you're much more prepared. When you get into seventh grade, because seventh grade is the spitz year. You seventh grade, you go and it's like the best of the best, because that's the age group where you really, really just eat camp. Um, and then obviously is eighth grade, and then you want to send you then specific to camp. But I, I, I advise to start at sixth grade if you could, obviously you gotta afford it, and the kid gotta be ready for it. So sending a child also regarding uh, being homesick, sending a child to Midwest or Canada, you think it makes a child more homesick? He's like a flight away from being from home than just being in the Catskills. Definitely. And by the way, homesickness is, uh, if you're a camper listening to this, or you want to go to camp, you're nervous about being homesick, don't feel bad. Don't worry. So homesickness is a natural thing. Even a kid that's not such a big mommy's boy could feel homesick, and that's okay. It's disgust in camp. Well, it's not discussed publicly because you don't want kids that weren't homesick to think 
Maybe now <laughs> is it a good idea? But let's become Umzik. So you got to have somebody in your camp that's trained specifically how to combat homesickness. It's, it's got to it's gotta happen. You've got to have somebody that really has experience in this and really knows how to take care of it. I've, I've had kids that were homesick. I've been, I've been a counselor in camps for years. In the past, and I, had, you know, I have kids in my bunk that were homesick. Sometimes it hits you the first day. It hits the kid the first day, some the second day. And very often it happens the first Friday night in camp where that's the time you're sitting at the table, everyone's schmoozing, and the kid's mind wanders back. What's going on at home now? And then he remembers his mother's chicken soup and the camp's food is good. It doesn't quite always add up to his mother's chicken soup. And that's where like those homesickness pains start going in. And as a, a guy that works in camp, I look out for those moments because I know what's going to happen. So very much, but especially the first Friday night in camp, super like the, the meal has to go. It's, not, it's not, not rushed, but one, two, three, each thing. There's no time to think. The counselors don't just sit at the head of the table. Back in the day, the counselors always sat at the head of the table, you know, and the campers always sat like over here. No, no, campers sit in the middle. The counselors in the middle. And that way they could talk to everybody. And you make sure that the council, you see a kid that's not schmoozing, change seats for a few minutes. Make sure everybody's schmoozing. And we send out the food course after course. One, two, three, four. And after it's done, then we start doing the mirrors. Now again, kid that comes to camp for the first time, he's just going to sing all of a sudden? Like, isn't he a little shy? Yes, he is. Is he going to sing? He's not just going to sing, he's going to be jumping on those benches. We start, obviously, with regular Shabbos mirrors, and we're jumping up and down, mamish, knocking, smira after smira after smira. There's nothing like a Friday night in camp, I mean a Shabbos morning as well, Shabbos afternoon as well, but the energy that goes into Zemira singing on Shabbos is lo yom and kiyosapa. In fact, we send out, after camp, we send out a survey what was your favorite part of camp? And very often, even the big sports kids, very often kids respond, Shabbos. And Shabbos is the day that there's no programming. There's no playing sports. There's none of the exciting stuff. There's no boating. There's no jets. We have, we have, we have our own lake. None of those type of stuff. What is it? It's the singing. It's the energy. It's the real, let's call it camp, authentic camping. So do you find that's when the most trouble happens as well for the kids who aren't into singing? They can find it really boring. And that's when the trouble starts brewing, no? Yes, exactly. Very good. So as I said, we, because I know all these things, we always have what to look out for. So for Shabbos and camp, I have specific people that are looking around for those bored guys that might start walking out escaping. There's people that are out there making sure they go back in. But I want to tell you, I'll be right. Okay, not, not, I can't, we can't get to every single kid. There's some kids that are very stubborn. But I'll be right. Even if a kid is not a Zemira's kid, and at home, I ask kids, you don't know, sing at home? No, not really. Even if a kid's like that, once they taste it and they really just sit, I tell kids, you don't have to sing along. I want you to sit back and just watch. But just really watch. Don't be upset. Don't be mad. Just drink it in. And once they do that for a few minutes or an hour or one night, let's call it, but the next day, they're all in. And sometimes it happened, you know, I remember this past summer, a kid was really homesick. He was crying all Friday night. Like I said, Friday night, he was crying, crying away. Couldn't sing. Second week, same story. I'm like, wow, two weeks. Ouch. But by the third week, this kid was literally the loudest in the room. It was unbelievable to watch. He called me after the summer. He said, can you send me the list of songs that I sang? He don't remember them. He was a fifth grader. Can you, can you send me the list of the songs that I sang? Because I want to sing that home, at home. It's, and he doesn't, in his house, he didn't sing that many mirrors. His father was like blown away. Again, this kid was crying. But the Shabbos mirrors got into him. 
What are some techniques with, with leading hundreds of boys, Shabbos Niras, in a lunchroom, a dining room? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you hear my voice, right now I'm very hoarse. It's the day after Purim, and I lose my voice. And that's the first technique. If you're not losing your voice, either you really know you took a lot of voice lessons, or you're doing something wrong. So Hashem actually blessed me with, with a kayak in my voice, that my voice goes a little bit more powerful than other people. And you get up there in the dining room, and I just really... I just let it out! Whoa! <laughs> So when to switch a song? Do you, do you stick on one song for a long time where you keep switching to keep things interesting? Or it depends? Well, the... it, that's, that's a great question, which is a, a question that Kumsitz guy's got to know the answer to. People, uh, singers have to know the answer to. I, the way I like it is we go, we sing the song, obviously once, twice. Again, a shop is Zemmer, because, you know, you sing the whole Zemmer through. But if it's a, you know, current Kishmaka energy song, so you got to at least sing it twice. Usually when it's going amazing, you sing it only one more time, and then you switch. Because you don't want to stop a song when it's burnt out. You don't want to stop a song when it's already dwindling. You want to stop it when it's powerful, and kids want more, and then you go into the next song, and they're, they're ready, okay, okay, they're, they're so hyped to do the next thing. So you don't, again, you don't want to burn out the oilum, so you sing it once or twice. These are comes in secrets right here. These are comes yeah. secrets, right. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's very important. It, like a good storyteller knows, when does he to be continued? When does he do that? By the good part, right? You want, the, you want them waiting for more. You don't want to stop something. You're like, okay, big deal. So the same thing is with singing. It's a person I would think that like, looking for a sleepaway camp, to also have to pay for a flight. <laughs> That's expensive. Though. You're asking the question for my personal camp, which kids have to fly out to. I, it, listen. Going to camp is very expensive. Personally, we try to give a lot of discounts, especially if someone needs it, and we're here to provide discounts because it happens to be, I just want to give a shout out to Rebutsi Weiss, the owner of the, this camp, who you know hired me to run it. He's not looking to make Parnassa off this camp. In fact, he loses tremendous amount of money off it. For the owner, it's mamish not a money-making industry, specifically over here, because he's doing it really, he knows the value of a kid that goes to camp, how much it could change his life. That's why he's doing it. So therefore, he's ready to give discounts. And he's ready to make it happen, make it work. He's a good kid, and he's going to bring Kishmach to camp, do it. There are, there are I know for a fact, in, here in Lakewood, New Jersey, there are funds, there are people, there are tzedakah organizations that help a kid go to sleepaway camp if a parent can't afford it. Because it's very important. So you're asking me about flying also the flight? That's a good question. You don't have to come to Camp Matzev. The point is, find a camp that you could go to, and that is affordable. But camps are expensive. And by the way, even though they're very expensive, I, I, I used to think that like camps overcharge. They really don't. It is extremely, extremely expensive to run a camp. It really, really is. And the kids really get the best bang for the bunk. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's expensive, and there's no way to, 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 to cut that. So, A, apply for, go to a camp that does have scholarships. Some camps don't give out scholarships, and I understand them. It's, it's a parnasa. So, you have to find the camp that it's not a parnasa for that specific camp. I could give a shout-out to a camp called Camp Akim. The owner of that camp is not looking to make a parnasa of the camp. So, some camps are, and some camps aren't. So, you have to find that, that good mix of the guy that's looking to do this as a toiva, a toiva, a rabbi, and uh, that knows there's scholarships. So do you really believe that, the, that you can't create that environment in a day camp setting and save money? I believe that there are day camps that try very hard to create the best sleepaway camp atmosphere, but that's what they're At doing. At 6 o'clock it ends. As that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're, they're nuchmachers. They're, they're trying to adapt to that, but you'll never be able to go and sleep where you can. Like I said, you don't have Shabbos. Shabbos is one of the biggest parts of camp. Tishabov. We have Tishabov in camp. I won't tell you. Like I said, we have a survey at the end of the camp. What was your most memorable moment in camp? 
a few kids this year wrote Tisha B'Av. And I'm talking about fifth, sixth graders. They write Tisha B'Av, one of the most memorable moments in camp. How is that possible? Uh, Tisha B'Av, we definitely don't have an exciting program. What do we have? We have authentic Yiddishkeit. Start in the morning. We don't say every single uh, thing the way, way our Rav tells us to do. We have speeches before each one, like most programs. But it's designed to think, I think, before each thing. Will this kid understand the lesson? Every speaker has a story that a kid could really relate to. It's not some random thing. We sing in the middle a few songs. We slow it down. And the kids really walk out wow. We really try, you have to try to create that atmosphere. So in a day camp, you don't have those moments. You really don't. So again, you could get a lot of that of day camp. But like as you said, after 6 o'clock, it's not even 6, I think it's 4. It's over. Let's talk canteen for a minute. Yeah, Because sure. I know that there are some children who have probably more money to spend at the canteen, some don't. What's an ideal amount of money that parents should be saying to children with? Is there an amount that they should be? A canteen is, is the one place where a kid really feels independent. Because at, at the end of the day, he's, he's running his schedule based off whatever camp is doing. He's not really feeling that independent so much. But when he has canteen time and he could buy whatever he wants, that's like, whoa. So that means that I could just go to the store and buy the whole store, right? That's what a kid feels. So it's very often to have a conversation with your son and tell him, look, camp costs a lot of money. I'm going to give you money for a canteen, but... Don't spend over this amount a day. Or I'm going to give you, let's call it $50, but that's it. So it's going to be up to you to figure out how much to spend per day, which is amazing, by the way. It gives the kids amazing chinuch on, on, by itself because they really need to make decisions. So, you know, it's also could die to find out Again, this is a hard question. Who are you going to call up for all these things? But it's good to find out in the camp that your kid is going to, what do they sell in the canteen? So what do I have to know? Most camps have a power of a menu or a milk, and a milk menu for lunch and then fleshes for supper. And fleshes could cost you know, a nice amount of money. If the kid's uh, buying a schnitzel sandwich at the canteen, it's going to cost you something. Um, so an ideal amount... I would say it's between fifty to hundred dollars. Don't give hundred dollars. Hundred dollars is a little bit too much. But between fifty and hundred dollars is, is 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 very nice. So you have the kids who are there every night, and you have the kids who can't afford to be there every night. Correct. They find it rough. Correct. Okay. In fact, we have uh, I look out for kids that can't afford camp, and so very often we find sponsors for our kids' canteen. If a kid's canteen bill is zero, because basically the day the kid comes to camp. All of the cash that he brings with him, we advise him to put into the canteen. And then we'll look through it. Hey, kid, zero money. What's going on? Look back at the notes. Yeah, this kid needed a scholarship. He couldn't afford camp. Okay, he needs something in that canteen. We'll make sure it happens. Let's talk color breakouts. What are you looking for? In a, what's, a, what's, a, what's a good color breakout? What are you looking for once you're printing color breakouts? <laughs> I don't know if that's your, that's your responsibility or not. <laughs> oh, everything is. But... <laughs> A color or breakout. You see, the problem with color or yeah. What's the problem with color or breakout? Is that it's color or is the last week of camp, and everybody knows. If if you're sneezing too much, oh, that might be color or breakout. Wait, I saw him say uh, on the phone, oh, color or breakout. They're looking out for it, so it's very hard to fight that. It really is. To so some camps, I'm like, okay, let's just make a cool breakout. To hire a helicopter to fly out and drop something on the kids or hire parachuters. That's if you want to spend money. And then you have like the, you know, old style camping thing that like, hey, you know, there was a kid, camper missing and the police come down to look for him. Or there was the, the, the food as food poisoning. Or uh, it's very rare that a kid should actually 
Spears <laughs> <laughs> of, of the can of the or surprise. Or surprise, yeah. or surprise. exactly, yeah. exactly. So I try to do a lot of fake outs before the real breakout, at least just to give excitement to the camp and have them on, on edge. Hey, oh, did that, that wasn't real. No, 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 that wasn't real. Uh, again, again? Like, no, Trusty all went out. And I was like, oh, call a breakout. I'm like, oh, 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 now it's working. Oh, just turn the lights back on. It didn't really go out. And I was like, where's the breakout? Well, I don't know. The color work what? I don't know what. So I like trying to create that atmosphere that the kids are like, you know, I'm one step ahead of the game. So I don't know who invented color war, but it's something that's been going on in camps for many years. Do you think there's something like beneficial from a, a growth or a perspective in color war? Another great question. So in fact, this past Torah Masora convention this year for Rabbeim, I was at it, and Rabbi Aaron Feldman spoke about color war and about what, what is this need to create this competition? And it's a great question. I went over to him afterwards and I said, can I speak to the Roshiva a little bit about my experience in color war? Because he was vocal that maybe you shouldn't do it. I spoke to him and I went over to him and I said, maybe, you know, we could, we, could talk, we could discuss it. He was very happy to discuss it. And in fact, after the conversation, he's like, I have to rethink it. It's actually good. I didn't, he brought up a lot of good points. Let's hear some of the points. So, why have color war? So, first of all, from a camp perspective, it's very good for the scheduling. Because towards the end of camp, kids are already much looser. They're going home anyways in a few days. So, they don't, they don't feel so much the need to stick to the schedule. So, Therefore, camps, that's what I think one of the reasons why they instituted color war is to make sure the last couple of days really end with a knock. Number one. Number two, what is the benefit that kids could have? So in every from camp, they have themes. Besides the color war, red and blue, or whatever colors you're using, they're always going to have themes. And the good from El camp, they're going to make sure that the lesson of the theme is really brought out in a way that the kids could take home a message. For example, um, Banam and Avadim, classic, where Banam of Hashem or Avadim of Hashem. And each team, whatever name they got, needs to bring that out in a theme song, which goes through a story and the concept brought out with a play. And, and also one of the kids actually are... Has, have to write a drasha and give it in front of the whole camp. And this, you understand, the staff are busy looking up Mar McLean's Svarim, calling up their Abayim or Yeshivas. Well, how do I bring out the concept like this, like this? It's amazing. And really, the kids really learn something very special from it. And there's amazing, amazing lessons that they actually come with. They come home. That's on a tiredic level. And then there are kids that really steig during color war. Because they're put on this pedestal to really be, bring out their best. Maybe they were never that Coco Club kid. Coco Club is, for those that don't know, every camp has before chakras to go to Coco Club. So in the classic camp, if you go to Coco Club during color war, you get an extra point for your team. Whatever that means. So during Coco Club, the kids kids that haven't woken up the whole summer, they make sure to be there during Coco Club. And they feel amazing about it. And every kid that's by chakras or whatever your camp is doing, they, they're incentivized to do it. And it really makes them feel good. And it gives them that power. And they know when they do something right, they don't just have to score the shot by basketball. They could do something that really is a real point system value. So it really gives them something good in return. That instant, instant gratification, call it, that they, that they feel. And also, kids that like singing or may be good at acting, we make sure, obviously, to put them in plays. And we have the singing time, which they really just, it's, it's just a real cohesiveness. It's just an amazing thing that they take home with them. It, it's, not, it's not a joke. When, when you announce at the end of color War, when the head counselor, and I get this host to announce, blue or red, you know, it goes on for five minutes. 
And afterwards, the kids that won, they are really, really, really happy. Why? Because they really, really worked hard to win. What do you do for the losing team? Is, is there anything to do for the losing team? Sometimes in life. It's a good lesson, too. It's a good lesson, exactly. <laughs> As I was about to say, yeah. you don't always win in life. I know this is the grand thing. And then before they announce the winner, the head staff typically walk off to so- somewhere. What goes on? That's what we want to know. What goes on in that meeting <laughs> between the grand thing and the announcement of who wins? <laughs> so, are the points really tallied? Are they really yeah. tallied? Exactly. You know, because they always just lose by like four to five points typically. Somehow, it's always so close. <laughs> exactly, and all the counselors know it must have been the singing, it must have been the sport, it must was have been it the, the learning. P- <laughs> oh, I was at him. Rabbi Bash, Rabbi Bash, the head counselor over there. It's extremely, extremely mocked, but that every single point is a real point. And in that meeting, in that little huddle, we really go through every point. Chazar over the songs. How much are they, were they worth? Their last shot. And we just discuss the, 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 the grand scene moment and really, really come out with something. Now, obviously, kids, you know, always thinking, okay, so let's flip the coin. Heads is blue this year. As a joke, we'll do that as well. But it's not the real thing. The real thing really happens in the camp huddle is really discussing who is the winner. But since that camp huddle, always kids are always wondering what are they really doing. I decided by us in Camp Matzev, I'm not having that. We stay directly in the dining room with everybody and we're on a dais. There's one computer, one little laptop, and it has all the scores already put in. And it's just during the grand scene, everybody is giving their scores as it goes along. Each song is, is rated and graded. So it goes in, and it's just a little couple of more clicks of the button, and we know the, we know the, uh, we know the winner. So it's all there. There's no hiding. There's no fake. There's no flipping the coin. There's no deciding, okay, blue won last year, red won the year before, so this year is blue again, or should we change the... No. It's a real deal. That's beautiful. That's the, that's the, that's a great lesson as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I feel like often camps they do like Holocaust stories and things which kids can't really relate to, and the, the actors themselves, you know, I don't know if they really know what's what are we trying to get out of a cantata, or is it just a night activity? So some camps uh, I know took that route, like you just said, it's a good night activity, and let's make a meaningful type of skit play, you know. So, it's a very big shiloh that I actually brought up to a few big mechanchem. You know, should we skeer those kids? Tati, no! Shema Yisrael! Like, is that really what we're supposed to be doing? Because that, does that bring the, what Tisha B'Av is about? Or maybe give a play. Should be a serious play, obviously. But something with a real lesson that they, that they could take out of. And it's not just a sad story or a scary story, but it's a story with a lesson that hits home and they can take home. So, for example, this past summer, we had a cantata that was based off listening to kosher Yiddish music. That was the lesson that was brought out. There was some cute parts to the, to the play. There were some sad parts, some scary parts, obviously, like every good play should have. But that lesson was so important. We had singers that, we, that gave us videos of them talking, telling the oil the importance about listening to kosher, not just Jewish music, but kosher Yiddish music. I have MBD because I had MBD's grandson as a council of camp. We had Joey Newcomb, Hugh the Green. They sent us videos of them talking the importance of how the, it talks to the Yiddish and the And that was the lesson that we brought out. So no Holocaust. Maybe I'm a little bit cutting edge, I'm 2024, and we're not doing the Holocaust thing. Maybe, yeah, maybe not. And I'm not against a Holocaust skit either, but it has to have a lesson. Thank you, Rabbi Klein. Thank you, May, for having me. It was a pleasure. And I hope everyone gained some real insightful information.